The launch of Intel's X299 and Core i9 series processors has been confusing for a lot of folks, and that's kind of by design because FUD benefits the market leader. But let me break that down for you and explain how this all works. Welcome to Gadget Blues, this is Casey, and today we're going to be talking about the recent launch of the Intel X299 platform and the associated CPUs, the KB Lake X and the Skylake X, known as Core i9, as well as Core i7 and Core i5 across that lineup. And yes, that means there are actually two different Intel architectures in the same lineup of CPUs for the same platform, and that's a good thing because Really what this is, is one socket to rule them all, socket 2066. As you can see, I'm a big fan of the previous X99 platform because of the number of PCI Express lanes that you get with the accompanying CPUs, giving you a lot of expandability for storage, 10 gigabit ethernet, all sorts of other things that you would wanna plug in, dual graphics and so forth. And another big advantage of these high-end desktop or HEDT as Intel tends to refer to them, is that they have very long life cycles. Uh, X99 has been around for quite a while and it has been upgraded from the Haswell, that's the fourth generation core architecture, to the Broadwell, that's the fifth generation. But it's getting a little long in the tooth and it was about time for Intel to replace it. It's nice that they moved up their launch from a rumored early 2018 or mid 2018 to the middle of 2017 because of the pressure from AMD. Competition is always a good thing. Right now, the X99 platform is running on Broadwell E, which is a derivative of the fifth generation platform. Meanwhile, we have moved on in the mainstream platforms to Skylake, which is sixth generation, and KB Lake in 2016, which is seventh generation. So in X299, we get the best of both worlds. We get some KB Lake, seventh generation, on the low end, and we get Skylake, which is what Intel is using currently for their Xeon processors in the high end of the X299 lineup. So again, that's two different architectures along the processor waterfall from a Core i5 and Core i7 using KB Lake X up through Core i9s using Skylake X. And all the way from four cores without hyper-threading as a Core i5, up to 18 cores with hyper-threading for a total of 36 on the high end. That is the broadest lineup of CPUs that Intel has ever shipped on one desktop socket. A total of nine processors in that waterfall from four to 18 slash 36 cores. And although they have that sort of flexibility in Xeon, this is the first time that we've seen that broad of a lineup in high-end desktop, which is a great thing. There are only four current CPUs on X99. And of those four CPUs on X99 currently, there are only two that are really interesting. The 6850, which gives us 40 lanes of PCI Express with 3.6 gigahertz, that's the highest clocked current model, and that's the best one for gaming, six cores at 3.6. Then the flagship is also pretty interesting, the 6950, which gives you 10 cores at 3.0, that's the best for content creation and encoding. Unfortunately, out of this big lineup of nine CPUs, we really kind of end up with the same situation where there are really two CPUs of interest out of the lineup, and I'll get to that and the details of it in just a few moments. So the first thing we should do is take a look at what X299 brings to the table versus X99 from a platform standpoint. So in X99, we have DMI 2.0. That's the link from the CPU to the platform controller hub. And DMI 2.0 runs at two gigabytes a second. DMI 2.0 is just a name for four lines of PCI Express 2.0. And that is the link to the platform controller hub that all traffic from the PCH has to pass through to get to the CPU. That includes all of the SATA, all of the USB, the ethernet, and additional eight lanes of PCIe 2.0 that are handled by the PCH. So DMI is a bottleneck. It's important to get that faster. So on X299, we have DMI 3.0, which is four gigabytes a second. 
that is a big step forward, much less of a bottleneck, twice as fast connection to the PCH. Then of course on the PCH itself, it has the eight lanes at PCI Express 2.0. And on X299, the PCH, PCI Express is 3.0, eight lines in each case. Then in terms of NVMe, which is really what you should be running for storage if you're into this level of platform, it's CPU only on the X99 side. And on the X299, you can do CPU or PCH. In fact, you get three X4 lane NVMe interfaces on the platform control hub for X299. Then there are a little bit of differences in uh, USB and SATA. You get six USB 3 versus 10 USB 3, and you get 10 SATA 3, which has been reduced a little bit to eight SATA 3, which you'll usually see as only six on most motherboards. So here we come to a really important point that you should remember. If you look at these X299 features, this may look very familiar to you if you are familiar with the Z270 platform because this is exactly the same PCH as the Z270. If you look at Intel's data sheets, they have just added X299 applicability to this part. And so this is the same platform controller hub that you'll get on any Z270 motherboard today with the same capabilities and the same features. In that sense, this is not a new platform, it's a new socket to connect to the existing platform. And that socket is bigger and more flexible, flexible enough to accommodate all the way from those four cores with 16 lanes of PCI Express up to the 18 cores slash 36 with the 40 lanes of PCI Express. All of these USB 3 ports, SATA ports, and so forth, including the NVMe capability, this is all done by allocation of the high-speed I.O. lanes that are provided by the PCH. And since this is exactly the same PCH as Z270, you should refer to my previous video that explains how the HSIO lanes are allocated on Z270 because it works exactly the same way on X299. I will link that video down below so you can check it out. It's important to understand how that HSIO allocation works to determine exactly how many of these devices you can put in at the same time and what the limitations are. So here's Intel's CPU lineup for the X299 platform at launch. You can see these nine SKUs that I mentioned earlier. And I think that only two of these have particular interest as sweet spots, and I'll whiteboard those in a second. One is that Core i7-7740X. That is badged a Core i7 because it has at least quad core with hyperthreading, but Core i7 has been something of a loose term recently. I think it's a great thing that Intel has introduced the Core i9 moniker because they have somewhat bastardized the Core i7 terminology, especially in mobile, producing a bunch of dual core with hyperthreading CPUs in mobile that they call Core i7. Now, if a dual core CPU with hyperthreading and a fast core clock is an i7, then wouldn't a Pentium G4560, which is also dual core at 3.5 with hyperthreading, be a Core i7? So you see what I mean there? They've made the waters a bit muddy. So Core i9, I think, is a great branding strategy for them because they've really squandered some of the value of the Core i7 branding. I mentioned that there are two CPUs in this lineup of nine that I think are the most significant and the two sweet spots as far as price performance and applicability are concerned. And those are the 7740X. That's the KB Lake quad core with four cores and eight threads. If you take a look at the specifications for this, you will notice that this is a 7700K CPU. It's just been put in the new socket 2066 package. It's the same KB Lake platform, same four cores, eight threads. The clock speed has been slightly bumped from 4.2 to 4.3. 
and the RAM now is 2666 instead of 2400. Those are minor changes that will allow this to outperform the 7700K for bragging rights, but it's essentially the same chip. It even has the same MSRP of 339 US dollars. So this is my first pick of the lineup because this is a great upgrade scenario. If you were considering a 7700K on Z270, then for a little bit more money on the motherboard side, because the X299 is going to cost a little bit more than an equivalent Z270 motherboard, you can get a terrific long-term upgrade story where you can go all the way up to 18 cores on the platform and move from 16 lanes of PCI Express up to 40 lanes. That will become even more important as we get more affordable NVMe devices, so you can have multiple NVMe storage devices on RAID, giving you terrific storage performance, as well as multiple GPUs, which will become more interesting as more games start supporting DirectX 12 heterogeneous GPUs, which allow you to use multiple GPUs that aren't matching even model or manufacturer. You could have an AMD plus NVIDIA in the same system without using SLI or Crossfire. Right now that's supported by a number of games that you could count on one hand, but it will be more important in the future. So between the declining cost of NVMe and the improving use of multiple GPUs, this will be a great upgrade story. You can get the equivalent of a 7700K now on a motherboard platform that will allow you to expand in future. I think that's a great story. We've had a bunch of people talking down X299, including a rant from Linus this week saying that he doesn't understand the strategy and so forth. I am completely in the other side of things. I think this is a great idea. If I were in the market for a new 7700K Z270 system, I would strongly consider going with the 7740X on X299, paying just a little bit more for the motherboard in the near term, and getting that upgrade capability down the line. Whereas if you are ready right now to get the high performance with 40 lanes of PCI Express, the 7900X is the CPU of choice. That's because this meets a great combination of being the first CPU in the lineup to have the 40 lanes of PCI Express and the highest core clock of all the CPUs in the 40 lane lineup. This essentially replaces the 6950X in the lineup, and it has the same 10 core count, but it goes from 3.0 to 3.3 base clock and 3.5 to 4.5 turbo. You also get 2666 RAM support instead of 2400, and on top of all of that, the bonus is that it is $999 US dollars. And while a thousand bucks sounds like a lot, the 6950X was $1,723. So you're saving over $700 going with a CPU that's faster, has faster RAM support, and a new platform to boot. So I think at $999, this is the high performance sweet spot of the lineup not just because of its position and features and so forth and price, but the fact that more cores than this are starting to get a little bit nutty, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. You may ask, hey, Casey, why is the 7900X the sweet spot when there are actually four SKUs above that in the lineup? And let's look at the flagship, the 7980XE. This thing has 18 cores and 36 threads. 18 cores is pretty amazing in the high-end desktop lineup, but before you get excited about that, there are some major caveats here. First of all, most of the workloads in content creation are now GPU accelerated. For example, Adobe Media Encoder and Adobe Premiere itself. So if you're running on CUDA, you aren't taking advantage of these cores. If you switched out of GPU acceleration, to run on the cores instead? Would this be faster than GPU accelerated operation? I 
don't think so, but we'll have to wait for some benchmarks on that. And I'm talking about content creation specifically because almost any other use you would have for this amount of cores would require ECC. This is a non ECC platform. This processor has the built-in memory controller like everything on this platform and the memory controller does not support ECC. ECC is memory that detects and corrects bit errors. Without ECC, you have a good chance, especially in stress situations with high heat and so forth, which is what you get when you're doing high-end tasks using all 18 cores. If there's the slightest flaw in your memory subsystem, not just the DIMMs themselves, but the motherboard and the memory controller on the CPU, then you are going to get flaws in your output and you won't know that those flaws exist. And whether that is a pixel glitch in video that you're rendering or whether it's a mathematical error in your oil and gas exploration, that is not something that enterprise level folks are willing to accept. If you're doing individual content creation for YouTube or for wedding videos or something like that, then you don't care if a random little sparkly pixel might show up someplace that no one will notice. But if you're doing DreamWorks level work, you're in Hollywood, you're doing oil and gas exploration, you are doing machine learning, all this other high-end stuff that you would need 18 cores for, you really need ECC. So there's this very narrow window of applicability for 18 cores without ECC. And that's an individual content creation that is not GPU accelerated. I'm willing to concede that there may be some individual content creation workflows out there that would benefit from 18 cores and would not need ECC, but I can't really think of any off the top of my head about the only task that I do on a regular basis that does not have GPU acceleration and doesn't need ECC is Handbrake because it's about the only encoder left that does not have GPU acceleration. And Handbrake won't use 18 cores. Handbrake barely benefits from 10 cores. Its sweet spot is about eight cores. Bear in mind, I'm not saying that the higher end processors in this lineup are not a value for price or whatever. I'm just saying that I can't figure out what they would be used for. So let me know in the comments if you have a work stream that could benefit from 18 cores and your response does not include words to the effect of, I'm willing to ignore the risk of not using ECC in this application. I'm genuinely interested in what you would use this for. Now, clearly you could use it for niche items as such as SETI at home or folding at home, but that's not what most people actually buy these CPUs for. The days of CPU mining for blockchain stuff are over and the content creation is CUDA accelerated and enterprise stuff requires ECC. So it's a very, very niche processor. I'm not saying it's bad, just I can't figure out what to use it for. Personally, I will be buying the terrific 7900X and counting my 700 and something dollars that I didn't have to spend this time around. One way that Intel is definitely superior at the moment is with their NVMe support. NVMe is what you should be running in any high-end platform for your primary storage. You can have some other SSD as your secondary. I am philosophically opposed to putting rotating media in a high-end desktop. That should be in a NAS. But boot off your NVMe, run your OS and your primary apps off of that. Then if you need some lower cost storage for additional space in the box, use a SATA as a secondary but don't put a rotating drive in your desktop. So NVMe support on X299. You've got an interesting story here because the PCH, same as Z270, as I mentioned, has support for three by four lane M2 NVMe or U2. M2 is the internal socket that gives you four lanes of PCI Express. U2 is the cabled socket that gives you 
four lines of PCI Express. They are functionally identical and the motherboard doesn't know the difference between them. So depending on the motherboard vendor and the real estate that they have free around the board after they put in all of that stuff like RGB lighting and so forth, they may go with multiple M2 slots, multiple U2 slots, or some combination thereof. But you can have three of a combination of these two interfaces and you can raid those together. But the benefit on X299, and this is not so much a platform thing as something introduced by Intel in software along with this product launch, is you can also have this VROC or virtual RAID on chip where this allows the Intel RST, the rapid storage technology, to create RAID volumes on NVMe devices that are connected to the CPU lanes of PCI Express, not just to the PCH. That means that you can have exciting things like, for example, one X16 PCIe card with four XM2 NVMe drives mounted on it. There have been a couple of these 16 cards with four M2 sockets on them, but they required special BIOS support that was proprietary from enterprise vendors such as Dell and HP, and those cards would only work in the targeted machines from their respective vendors. Workstation class hardware from Dell and HP. Intel has opened this up to the mainstream non-OEM folks in X299, which is cool. You get, apparently, from their press releases, RAID 0 in the base platform for this, and then you can buy a VROC hardware key to authorize you to get uh, RAID 1 slash 10 for $99 and RAID 5 for $300 US. Linus was also bitching about these costs as well. I don't think any of this is relevant because you really don't need to do RAID 1 or RAID 5 with NVMe on a content creation workstation. You want raw speed, and so you'll be reusing RAID 0. The only case in which RAID 1 or RAID 5 makes sense in a content creation workstation using NVMe is if you are paid so highly per hour that you can't have any downtime because RAID 1 and 5 in any actual end user machine is not there in replacement of backup. It's there to provide a high availability solution. In other words, you can continue doing your content creation work while the volume is down or being repaired. I would argue that Anyone who is making that amount per hour on their content creation workstation and absolutely has to have it working 24 by 7 under any circumstances because they'd be losing a lot of money should be using a name brand workstation from HP or Dell and using a Xeon CPU with ECC. So th this from a non-ECC processor to have RAID 1 or 5 would be an incredibly niche application. So I don't think there's any point in that at all you would just be using RAID 0. The benefit of running your NVMe devices off of CPU lanes instead of off of PCH lanes is because A, you get better latency because there's absolutely nothing in between your NVMe devices and the processor itself. And B, you don't have to have all of the NVMe devices, let's say four of them on an X16 card, going through that bottleneck of four PCIe lanes between the CPU and the PCH. Right now, one Samsung 960 Pro NVMe M2 device will do like 3,500 megabytes per second, and you can only do 3,940 through the DMI 3.0 interface. So having two or three of those rated and bottlenecking through the DMI is not going to give you much better performance. Whereas if you put them all on the CPU, you'll see some incredible sequential transfer rates. The biggest benefit from getting all these in RAID 0 is that you can split it up amongst multiple smaller M2 devices. So instead of having to buy, for example, a 2 terabyte 960 Pro, which is very, very expensive, you could buy four 512s, put them in RAID 0, and you get two benefits from that. One is that it's cheaper per 
gigabyte to buy the smaller size NVMe devices. And two, if you split up all of the rights on four devices instead of one, you get four times the endurance. Warranties today are not for a number of years, they are actually for terabytes written over the lifetime of the drive. So you have four times the lifetime if you have four devices versus one device of the equivalent size. All right, that's our look at X299 today. I hope you found that interesting and found some things that you didn't find on other YouTube channels. That's what I try to provide as I watch all these other videos that other people produce and try to fill in the blanks that they didn't address. And that was the point of today's exercise. So please like, subscribe, and more importantly, forward along links to my stuff to other folks that may find it interesting. Thank you very much for watching, and we will catch you in the next Gadget Blues.